Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. This is Business of Creating with Brain and Bullish today. And of course, coming to you from the amazing Writers Guild for our panel today on crisis-focused storylines. Thank you everybody for coming today. You can see we've put our first uh, slide up, making sure, hey, don't forget to talk with each other, network and e-meet each other, please. Make sure you introduce yourself, go into the chat, uh, give us your name, where you're from, what you do. And, you know, as uh, my partner in, in panels always says, uh, it's up to us, help each other to make our creative industry stronger. As we know, it's a collaborative process and relationship business. And, oh, note to self, we're doing our Q&A in the Q&A section, not the chat, everybody. In the chat, it'll tend to get lost. So any questions you have throughout the panel, we'll be doing our best to answer them in a timely fashion. And again, put those in the Q&A section. Okay, backing up to the beginning. Here's our panel overview. As we know, we are we're focusing today on crisis-focused storylines, truths, misperceptions, and how to create your own perfect storm. Our topics today, what creators and producers get right, uh-oh, what they get wrong, what resources are available to ensure authenticity at every stage, and what action steps you, the creator, can take now to make your project rise to the top. Everybody, a super, super thank you to the Writers Guild Foundation. Enid, please take us through the Writers Guild Foundation. Hey, everybody. I'm Enid Portuguez, the Director of Communications and Events at the Writers Guild Foundation. We're super excited to partner with Business of Creating and Brain and Bullish for today's panel. If you're new to the foundation, we're an LA-based nonprofit dedicated to the craft of writing for the screen. We offer services to the screenwriting community, such as a script library and archives, virtual events with film and TV writers and community outreach programs. Uh, for more info on what we do, please visit our website at wgfoundation.org or follow us on social media. I'll throw those handles and links uh, in the chat. Thanks so much and hope to see you at more events. Absolutely, thank you, Enid. And our amazing partners here on this panel, Brain and Bullish, Gabby, Please uh, tell us more about your wonderful company. Yes, thank you so much and hello to everyone. Brain and Bullish is here to help you get your stories about crises, disasters, and tales of heroism right. How do we do that? We offer opportunities for writers and producers to engage experts. We offer, we offer a series of virtual workshops and we create resources for anyone and everyone to access. So after this webinar today, go to this link. We'll also drop it in the chat. And there's a special guy created just for you. Thanks so much. Back to you, Jennifer. Oh, thank you, Gabby. Yeah, we couldn't do it without you. You're bringing us some amazing experts. And one final introduction, of course, we are Business of Creating. Uh, that's it's me. I'm Jennifer Mangan. That's my partner there, Michael Fisk. Uh, we founded this. This is an ongoing interactive Q&A panel, panel series with uh, seasoned entertainment and in this case, disaster experts. Very excited to learn from all of you. Our purpose in doing these panels to provide unique opportunities for content creators across all platforms to gain useful information and apply practical action steps, both in the creation of and selling of top quality projects. So everybody, I know you've got your pencil and paper and et cetera is ready to take down all these wonderful notes. All right, we have already networked and met with each other. Business of Creating, we are doing our 20th panel right now. We are so fortunate that you keep wanting to learn more from us and we keep getting these amazing experts that wanna share their wisdom. So a huge thank you. You can see we do a lot with marketing materials, development, financing, producing, distribution. Basically it's up to you to write and do the creative part. You're gonna learn from us a lot more about how to get it out there and be successful with it. Jumping in today, crisis-focused storylines, truths, misperceptions, and how to create your own perfect storm. Look at these amazing panelists, everybody. I am the most fortunate person in the world that I get to learn from these awesome experts. Gabby, tell us all about them, please. Thank you. So we believe that with all the crises that have happened over the last year, hashtag 2020, 
what didn't happen then, uh, many of you are going to feel compelled to create stories that touch on what's happening in the headlines. And who better to learn from than from those who know what really happens in reality and those who know what should and could be translated on screen. So today we are going to hear from Aaron Rasan Thomas, who grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, developing a love for storytelling after completing a fifth grade assignment to create his own original Greek, Greek myth from scratch. As time passed, Aaron developed his passion for storytelling visually and attended Morehouse College. Aaron would, would matriculate through the University of Kansas, earning honors in English literature before moving to Los Angeles and attending the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. After graduating from USC, Aaron was selected for the prestigious CBS Writers Mentoring Program. He, be he began his professional career at Soul Food, the series, NBC's Friday Night Lights, for which he received a Peabody Award, as well as CBS procedurals such as Numbers and CSI New York. Aaron has also served as a co-producer on TNT's Southland, Fox's Sleepy Hollow, and Netflix's The Get Down. He's had two screenplays produced as feature films. If you look in his background, you'll see more about that. And Aaron is currently the co-creator and executive producer of the procedural series reboot of SWAT, which airs on Wednesday nights on CBS. We're also gonna hear from Lorraine Snyder, who is a certified emergency manager leading rigorous training programs for the Walt Disney Company, UCLA, as well as local jurisdictions and nonprofits. In 2020, she launched the Emergency Management Growth Initiative, which makes the emergency management profession more visible and accessible. She is the producer and host of the COVID-19 Heroes uh, podcast. She is currently pursuing a master's at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And in 2014, she left her European roots behind to move to Los Angeles, where she currently resides with her wife. Uh, also, we're going to hear from Kate Hutton, who is a strategic advisor at the City of, City of Seattle's Office of Emergency Management. There, she coordinates communications, serves as a public information officer, and manages the Alert Seattle program. Previously, Kate was at the City of Los Angeles, where she managed uh, responses to large events and major emergencies with the LAPD and LAFD. Uh, Jen, to you for the first question. Okay. Uh, I'm just, I'm excited. We're going to get the, the most amazing info today. So the quick overview, everybody, crisis disaster overview. What are they? Where do they happen? What kinds of crises do we have? Natural versus man-made. And then we'll be jumping over to Aaron for how producers and writers determine which crisis to highlight on TV and where these resources are. So Kate and Lorraine, our disaster experts, please walk us through what are some of these disasters and crises and what what really floats people's boats in film and TV? Tell me more. What happens where, when? Let's start sure. with you, Kate. Sure. So, um, you know, there's natural versus man-made hazards and disasters. And then there's also kind of scope and scale disasters. So we'll start with the two different types. Natural hazards and I will say natural hazards, it's kind of a movement within emergency management to get away from the term natural disaster. Um, just because of the idea that there's no such thing as a natural disaster. Disasters are usually the result of human choices, a lack of preparation, a lack of mitigation, um, socioeconomic disparities. So no natural disasters, natural hazards. Um, so that can be anything from weather to fire to earthquakes, uh, volcanoes, all that stuff. And then there's man-made. And so that can be, you know, the big bad, you think of terrorism and active shooters, um, but also smaller things, you know, car accidents, um, everyday emergencies that kind of touches on the idea of um, emergencies are different for everybody. And it's an emergency is, you know, everything is going bad. A disaster is it's beyond the scope of your abilities to handle. And a catastrophe is like, oh, crap. Sorry. Uh, she told me not to curse before and it took me a second. We'll edit that. We'll yeah, sorry. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I would say that when it comes to emergencies, everybody, there are everyday emergencies people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And you'll see that in TV, obviously. You'll see medical emergencies, fire, um, police response. But then there's, of course, the things that make the headlines. Um, I don't know if all of you saw today um, out in Dallas, Fort Worth, there was a 75 car pileup because of a quarter of an inch of ice. So very small events can turn into massive, massive, essentially disasters. So um, that's kind of the, the scope. Of course, um, what what's make, makes a fun story is definitely more the fantastical side of disasters, a Sharknado or a, um, you know, 
an earthquake that triggers a volcano that triggers a hurricane, all that jazz. But uh, that's kind of a broad overview of the types of things that we can see in our job. Wow, you know, my brain just went so many different directions at once. Um, and so uh, I'm actually, I wanna jump over to Aaron briefly if I could, because uh, Kate was doing such a wonderful job of, you know, talking about the, the small things versus the big things and, you know, how things escalate kind of snowball, if you will. And so Aaron, if you can take us through a bit more of that creative process of, well, what, what do you tend to focus on in your writer's room? How do you make that choice of, you know, we'd better go with this disaster. We'd better do the car crash. We better do the, you know, school shooting that we're gonna go over later. Um, what, you know, can you take us through the process from the creative viewpoint? Yeah, I mean, what I can tell you from the creative viewpoint is that, you know, in choosing what type of crises you want to address, it tends to be based on the world that you've set up for your individual series. So in the case of SWAT, um, large, large percentage of the, the crises that we deal with are man-made, uh, meaning, you know, caused by criminals, caused by groups, caused by individuals, um, terrorists, bombers, kidnappers. Um, you know, there are some shows that, that um, perhaps deal more with first responders who may deal with uh, more of the, you know, the nature-based uh, crises. And occasionally we'll use one for background. We, we had a season opener in uh, season two, our season two opener that dealt with um, an earthquake happening while there were uh, kidnappings going on. So we had to deal with both man-made and natural at the same time. But typically how we tend to, um, to decide early on um, is, you know, we're a show that typically features crises that are large in scope, you know, and definitely on our show, most of the crises that we deal with tend to be kind of once in a lifetime situations in real life. But um, our goal is to ground those larger than life situations with the truth of human experience and the emotions behind it. I'll get further into that as, as we go, but we tend to choose them mo mostly based on what we want our characters to feel, what we want them to go through, and we find the appropriate crises to put them in in order to, um, to personify what, what emotions we want to we wanna explore. I love that because it sounds, you know, it's uh, almost the reverse process than it sounds like where you're saying, okay, we want them to experience this. So what situation would bring that about? Yes. I mean, that a lot of times we feel as though that's where emotional truth can come from is, mm -hmm. is really going off of what the truth starts with the emotion for us. What, where do we want to put the audience? What do we want them to feel? Do we want you to feel a sense of panic, a sense of fear, a sense of grief? Um, and then we tend to pair that up a lot of times with what is a crisis that might be most appropriate to explore that. Um, and then tons of research then is based on going into exactly that crisis that we choose that's appropriate for it and getting the details and, and checking with, um, you know, professionals and with experts in those fields. But it always starts with, at the core, um, what's the emotional truth that we want to explore? And we try to pair that up with with the appropriate crises. To well, Lorraine, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please. I was just going to say the same thing. Gabby, go for it, please. Thank you. Awesome. So to Lorraine, for when writers and producers want to make sure that their crises actually make sense and would be authentic to a, a real location, what resources would you recommend to help people research, just like Aaron was talking about research, um, what could realistically take place in a city or a town somewhere? A great question. There's a lot of open sources, uh, open source information that's available out there. Um, so a few that I can highlight in FEMA, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Administration and state and local governments, they all produce plans and, and such that are online that you can find. But a couple of specific tools that I can highlight, one would be the National Risk Index, which is an online tool that helps illustrate the nation's communities most at risk. So you have a map of the United States and all the counties are on there and it shows you what, where you will experience the most social vulnerability or community resilience. And LA, for example, has been featured as the top uh, county that is most at risk for a few years now. So that can really show you exactly um, what kinds of risk you can, risks you can experience where. And then there's also another software that could 
potentially be helpful to, to writers. It's the Hazus modeling software that FEMA um, created that is free and that helps estimate risk from earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, um, tsunamis. So you can put in you know, what event you want there to be, where it's taking place, and what the realistic um, consequences are of that event in your area. So if you wanna be real specific, real realistic, you can definitely use the tools that we as emergency managers use ourselves. And I'll definitely say, reach out to your local office of emergency management, wherever the story is based, let's say, I don't know, you're wanting to do Oklahoma City, then reach out to your Oklahoma City Office of Emergency Management and they will be able to pro provide you with some detailed information on that. I will second that. I really enjoy when people, when, it ha when I lived in LA, I was working in LA, people would reach out to us sometimes and I actually enjoyed it because sometimes you'd see what you recommended in the show and it was very exciting. So uh, I was, con consulting is a strong word, but I was talking to a producer from The Affair. Um, there was an episode about a fire evacuation, I think, and they used some um, very accurate emergency messaging content because we had spoken on the phone and via email about how emergency messaging actually works, what they could expect to receive, what we would be sending, what that would look like. And um, it, the episode aired actually during a fire. So I was in the EOC and very busy, um, but somebody came by and showed me a screenshot of the episode and it was all very exciting for us. In emergency management. <laughs> I've heard that because I can say on the other side, there's nothing that makes a writer feel better than to sound smart by talking to people who know what they're talking about. You know, so being able to knowing to knowing who to go to for the right answers and and having an open ear and also knowing what questions you need to ask in order to get the information that you need is is vital. You know, if you're going to do if you're going to try to tell stories on hazards or, or crises. If I could jump in really quickly, uh, Gabby, thank you so much. Look in the chat, everybody, National Risk Index. She's got the, you know, the website right there. She's also got the uh, hazardous modeling data. It's all right in there, everybody. Copy that down super quick. And we see a couple of questions here. We're getting to them. We're getting to them, everybody. All right, I'm going to jump back into my share screen so we can move to our next. Here I go. Here we go, I'm sharing it, our next card. We've talked about this. Come on, whoop, come on card. All right, jumping in quickly. I'm always curious, because I know if I see something is based on a true story, I'm more interested in watching it, as is my mommy. Uh, so must see TV and film. Uh, current scenarios, more which ones are more compelling? Uh, current ones, historical ones, based on true events. Do we find that Certain things t tend to grab people more. Is it, you know, tell me more, everybody. I mean, it's really, you know, subjective, right? You know, when it comes down to, I mean, certainly there are certain types of storylines that seem to resonate at different periods of, you know, history, pop culture history, for sure. And I think there's a space for all three, you know, depending on the, the audience, right? There's, um, you know, certainly, I mean, in my experience, I've worked on on um, first responder, you know, cop shows um, that have often taken things from current events. You know, um, Law and Order, the show that's aired for forever, has always been famously, you know, ripped from the headlines type storytelling where you're taking from current events and dramatizing them. But certainly, I, I have to say that the further I get into my career, the more I'm interested in historical events as well, you know, just because of how much, how many things still resonate um, from the past. And if there's a way to, to a lot of times tell stories that are from the past, but kind of show how often they have parallels with what we're going through today. You know, we just went through this on SWAT where, you know, we have a season four that we're currently in the midst of telling and our season premiere dealt with um, the legacy of the civil unrest that happened in 2020, but it didn't just stop there. It also went into the parallels of, of some of the things that have been really in the climate for multiple generations, you know? So, and for much of our audience, um, to our surprise, but, but also to, to our inspiration, um, there are some people that didn't really think about those patterns. You know, the, the fact that a lot of the, you know, in that particular subject matter, when you're talking about cops and community, police and community, these are issues that are, weren't just born in 2020. If you go back, 
Uh, we told our story based on the city of Los Angeles, so that has a unique history. And so along with 2020, you had the Rodney King riots in 1992, you had the Watts riots in 1965, and even before that, if you go back and to the 1920s, there were problematic issues going on. This is all within one city, um, and every city kind of has that pattern. So the historical elements certainly, um, I find can be not only really entertaining, but also there's a nutritional value too, to hopefully kind of learn from those patterns and improve uh, would be the goal. Um, so certainly I think there's room for each of those aspects, depending on who you ask and, and the way the story's told. Excellent. I agree. Sorry, sorry, I'm jumping in. I'm having a one-on-one -on -one convo all of a sudden, please. I was just going to say that I agree with Aaron that it's pretty, it's very much a subjective, subjective um, perspective on what you like. I really enjoy um, movies and, and films based on true events. Um, and I think too, uh, what I like is really the emotions that you know, you make me feel by watching something and it doesn't always have to have a lot of destruction or anything involved with that, even if you're depicting a disaster. For example, looking at the movie Sully that's based on the plane that landed in the Hudson River in 2009, all passengers survived and therefore everybody in the movie survived. And still it was such a, a, a compelling movie I thought where you really felt with the characters um, particularly the pilot and you could still see what a traumatizing experience it is and get something from that movie um, without having yeah full-on destructions and fatalities everywhere and all of that. And to expand on Lorraine's point I think a lot of people think of disasters as the big explosion and then it's kind of over once the hurricane's out of town the flooding has receded it's over but for a lot of people in the public the real disaster is afterwards and it's the recovery and the trauma that builds and builds and is often not supported by our existing structures and so um, you know the initial hazard itself, the earthquake or the tsunami or anything, that's all usually over and done relatively quickly. Um, but the recovery and the long-term trauma that builds in a community after disaster like that, um, there's not a lot of explosions, but it's much harder to deal with. Yeah, and to, and to piggyback on what, what Kate and Lorraine are saying, um, you know, modern day visual media is kind of what what for better or for worse books used to be as far as documenting how we process that trauma. You know, what, what stories tend to do a lot of times is, is allow us to kind of process and make sense of things that have happened. And nowadays, I mean, you know, movies are, are kind of time capsules in a way, you know, that kind of document things that are going on. So years from now, you know, someone may be as likely to look at a movie about the, the South Asian tsunami as they would be to go back and look at newspaper articles about it. You know, the, the story as a way of kind of like making it make sense in a digestible way. Um, and stories have always done that since the beginning of time, going all the way back to the myths to explain things that were scary or large and allow us to process them. And, you know, visual media is just kind of an extension of that current day. I think that there, the, the question that's coming up that would be a nice transition to the next card and kind of flows with what the conversation is, is what is a good example? This is a um, question from, I think it's Mickey. For the panel, in your opinion, which natural hazard would be the most difficult to write and or portray in terms of cap capturing the authenticity of that hazard? I'm gonna say from an emergency management perspective, um, it's the long, slow drip type emergencies like the pandemic, quite frankly. Um, I'm not sure how many people have seen the movie Shin Godzilla, but emergency managers often joke that it's the most accurate emergency management movie because it's just people huff hustling from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, they cut to Godzilla every now and then, <laughs> and they go to another meeting and have to worry about changing uniforms because they're meeting with a different person. Um, so, you know, things that are long-term, very bureaucratic, you know, that's, it's a different story than a disaster story. It's, a, <laughs> it's a, a very different story. It's more of a, you know, political procedural, I don't know. So I think that's really tough to tell because, um, I mean, you can tell human stories for sure, but if we're talking about telling the story of a disaster itself and the hazard itself, that's a really tough one. It's not very visual. Um, that would be my, my first kind of, 
thought. The other thing I think is tough to tell accurately um, is an earthquake. I mean, I, I think just people, it, it feels different to be in a major earthquake than it looks on television. Um, and so I think it's hard to tell that really accurately. Same thing with a, um, and I know this is another one, but a volcano, people think volcanoes are, but actually the real problem is like ash and gas and stuff. It's not very visual. Hey everybody, I hope you have Kate's private email and phone number because you're gonna, you know, be calling her about the volcano stories now and the ash and everything. <laughs> In fact, Aaron's taking some notes right now. I can see on the side, right? Yeah, it's a volcano. Volcano. A volcano is one of the only things that LA is not prone to. There's like I think 16 <laughs> disasters that FEMA outlines as kind of major things we worry about. Volcano is one of three that LA doesn't have to worry about. So lucky that on is, that front. That doesn't mean the storytellers have not tried. <laughs> Volcano, where a volcano springs up in the middle of uh, Wiltshire. Hey, Volcano is the only movie with a named emergency manager in it. Major movie. I've heard that there's one That's sort true. of. Yeah. The hero of the movie. movie. Yeah. 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 I'm actually, I'm going to jump back on for our next slide, but I saw a great question here from Michael, uh, which kind of leads into our next slide. He says, as a writer, how do you not oversell the stakes in a crisis oriented story? Is there such a thing as too much on the line? Uh, I mean, I suppose it depends on how you find define too much. Um, I tend to find that, again, with any story and any story having to do with hazards or crises, it's still going to come back to whatever emotional aspects um, you're trying to convey. Um, certainly, you want to do your research. So if you were to tell a story about a volcano eruption, you want to try to have that portrayed in as grounded a way as possible, you know. Um, you know, so there may be such a thing as too much if, if logically we find it hard to believe, you know, do we buy that one volcano will destroy the entire world? Maybe, yeah, eventually, maybe, you know, if you were to actually step <laughs> it out, you know, um, within one afternoon, that might be hard to buy. But, you know, that is based on then doing research behind the actual crisis itself. Um, but I always think with emotions, though, you can, you can, I don't know if there is such a thing as too much if, if they actually ring true to who the characters are. Love it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, all right, writing our crisis-focused storylines, what do we get right? What do we get wrong? What are some other resources? Let me see. Um, you know, actually, Kate and Lorraine, if you want to jump in first uh, with the actual practicalities of what happens, how does the government, you know, step up? What do private companies do? How do we get to, you know, get to the end zone successfully? Yeah, so, Lorraine. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Oh, no, Lorraine, I, I know Lorraine and I spoke before, so I know Lorraine has some good stuff on this. I'll kick it over to her. Uh, well, so, I mean, one big piece that's all, always missing that we just talked about is the emergency managers and the realization that you have people who are working year round to prepare communities for emergencies. Uh, we conduct a lot of outreach, we train citizens, we train our employees, and we monitor ad, uh, events in advance. Um, it's not like, oh, suddenly an, something happens and only now we're jumping into action. And once something is happening, we are activated 24 seven in our emergency operation centers and uh, responding to, to the events. Um, when it comes to, and I'll, I'll let Kate talk more about that piece, but I will, in terms of the things that you see, um, one big assumption is that after a disaster, you have complete social breakdown. You have mass panic, everybody is leaving, nobody can really act rationally. You have looting that's taking place everywhere and people turning on one another. And I mean, we've experienced COVID-19 and I think the worst thing we've seen is people hoarding a lot of toilet paper. <laughs> so, you know, if that's the, the worst that, that we get, then I think we're, we're pretty good off. And actually what we do see is communities really coming together after a disaster. It actually really strengthens the ties that communities have and can build. And you see that altruism really come out and a good documentary that shows that is National Geographic's documentary, Rebuilding Paradise, which is really excellent mm -hmm. and focuses on how this town of Paradise, which was completely devastated entirely, uh, how they have come back together to recover from this um, devastating experience. And it's incredibly 
inspiring and hopeful and it really shows the true humanity that comes out after a crisis event. I 100% agree with Lorraine on that. Um, all the research shows us that people come together, they help each other, they find ways to get through and fill the gaps of where society, where government, where business haven't been able to respond to their needs. And so um, that's a huge, I think, misconception, not just among the public. I mean, even within public safety, you hear people talking about, well, we got to worry about looting. Like, we don't actually, and the research bears that out, um, certainly be aware of public safety, but looting is not as big a concern as people tend to think. Um, I think another major misconception, and maybe misconception is the wrong word, um, but a major kind of like understanding the need, obviously, for composite characters. You can't have 200 people on screen responding to an emergency, um, all telling a story. But I think sometimes what's lost in a lot of disaster and emergency response type movies is the people behind the scenes who aren't wearing badges and uniforms, um, the people who are handling everything from plumbing, I saw somebody mention in the chat, to um, just traffic control and things like that. Uh, I actually saw somebody introduce themselves earlier as a city of Los Angeles disaster service worker. So they are a public employee um, and they are not in their day to day job well, for the past year, probably their day-to-day -day job, but normally when they were hired to the city of Los Angeles, they were not hired to do a disaster response job. But that person has stepped up and said, I am going to help respond to COVID-19. I'm going to help respond to an earthquake or a fire. Um, and I'm going to support how I can. Now, we're not giving them a fire hose and telling them to put their lives on the line necessarily. But what we are asking is, can you help um, direct traffic at a vaccination site? Or can you help staff a shelter? Um, so that's going on, but also just in terms of actual city um, city functions that aren't maybe disaster service workers, but people who get the things that um, responders need. Our job as emergency managers, part of it is to anticipate the needs of those field responders. So um, looking out 12 hours, 24 hours saying, this is a situation on the ground now and they've got that handled. I don't worry about how to tell a firefighter to put out a fire. I don't worry about how to tell a cop how to take down an active shooter, not my job. My job is to say, what are going to be the needs 12 hours from now? Do we need to do family reunification centers to make sure that the people who've been separated from where they normally are in a class or they were evacuated, do we need to bring people back together? Are we feeding our first responders? Are we feeding our evacuees? Um, things like that. So that kind of gets lost, I think, often. And then the people who just get the stuff, like a big part of disasters is procurement and bureaucracy, <laughs> um, buying things. And you see that even in COVID-19, people are very frustrated obviously with the lack of masks and the lack of PPE. Um, procurement is very difficult in the best of times. It's even worse when um, everything is bad. So <laughs> um, I think that's one thing that's get lost. And I think another major misconception is how quickly we can get a full picture of a disaster. Um, and that's both true in the immediate sort of while it's happening. Um, you'll see a lot on social media during an active shooter event. The most common rumor that spreads is that there's multiple shooters. Almost every single active shooter event, you will see on Twitter a report of multiple shooters. Almost never true. Um, I've worked one active shooter incident where there were multiple shooters and it was the same Bernardino terrorist attack. So um, pretty you know, a unique situation. Um, and that just goes to show that we as emergency managers need to be able to verify correct information and people can't immediately trust always what they see on social media. And also, you know, we need time to get a full accurate picture of what's going on. Sometimes you're trying to balance understanding exactly what's happening with saving lives. And so um, sometimes movies and TV are a little optimistic about the ability to get a full picture and get everything squared away and tied up very nicely in a bow. Um, so that's one part of it. And then the longer term, um, we don't know everything, we're not omniscient. We're, so I think a lot of times people expect us to have eyes and ears everywhere. Um, we in government have to balance privacy rights and a lot of different laws, um, accessibility issues, You know, making sure that everything we do is in multiple languages and accessible to people with disabilities. And so um, sometimes expect us to provide Google product levels on you know, shoestring government budgets with bureaucracy and that's not always possible. So those are some of the major misconceptions, I think. Awesome. For Aaron, I know that you get help to get the details right in all of your shows, whether it's active shooter episode or talking about extremism. What are some of the organizations or the groups or people that you use to get your show's information right and accurate? Well, I'll offer a few of those. Before that, I do feel compelled, though, that what I want to say with, a, with scripted 
storytelling at least, and we talk about this quite often, is that the nature of scripted Torah storytelling is is somewhat artificial even in, in its very setup. So what I, what I tend to tell um, any viewers who have um, any criticisms of how it's not exactly like real life, um, understand that the setup for the very nature of what you're watching is already somewhat artificial in, in just what it is. You know, human problems don't tend to be addressed within 30 minutes to an hour. Lives don't tend to be interrupted by commercial breaks. In real life, we, we often say things to each other more in shorthand than with clear sentences that a third party can fully understand. These are all part of um, the storytelling uh, view. That said, what you wanna do is try to get as much as possible um, the grounded truth of the emotions behind the situation. Um, you know, we're in a business of scripted storytelling, which is different than a documentary or literally a camera on the wall observing real life. It's a, st it's a stage situation. So that said, what we've been fortunate to do in SWAT, we, we put a heavy emphasis on research, especially when it comes to any type of sensitive crises or, or hazards. You know, we did a, a school shooting episode in season two, and it really, really took us um, two seasons to decide if we wanted to do it or not, because we really wanted to honor and make sure that we put in the research in order to be able to pull it off in a way where we were clear about what we wanted to say and we were clear about um, exactly the details that we wanted to cover. We didn't want to glorify that situation. And we didn't want to glorify the rescuers with guns in that type of story. We wanted to really be clear about what it is, um, the ripple effects off of that, the effects of family members. We want to be clear about um, the effects on the first responders going in and then afterwards. And so it took us a good two years, two seasons to really put that together. As the time came though, you know, we put in research, a writer of, of the episode was able to talk extensively with the, the Secret Service um, about the Safe Schools Initiative, uh, their National um, Threat Assessment Center. Um, um, we were able to get a, a path that kind of helped us um, in discussing sustainable practices to keep children safe um, and with guidance on, you know, kind of how to's of how to create target, um, the, the targeted violence prevention program. These are aspects that as we were researching the episode, we wanted to make sure we included um, in the episode. We also spoke with not only the, the Los Angeles Police Department, but the Los Angeles School Police Department, which is the, the largest of its kind of independent school police departments in the country, um, and has contacts with the FBI and other government agencies. But we talked extensively with them. You know, we, Our show on SWAT, and this again goes back to what, what is the target of your story, is we're an aspirational show that looks to try to offer ways to improve you know, solutions. Um, and so definitely with the school shooting episode, what we're looking to do is try to do necessary research so that we can at least um, try to put forward, you know, ideas of ways to try to prevent as much as possible these things from happening again, and not just tell a story about and a situation that we responded to. Um, you know, we've done other episodes um, that were also on, on sensitive topics. We did one on, um, on suicide, and in particular, suicide amongst Los Angeles police officers, which is uh, its own crisis that isn't spoken about um, very often. But we wanted, since our show is set in Los Angeles amongst the LAPD, we felt that that was a topic that we needed to cover. And again, ahead of time, we, we this is a year and a half of research of, of talking to psychologists with the LAPD Behavioral Sciences, um, Sciences Services Division, the BSS, um, talking to the National Suicide Prevention uh, Lifeline, talking to um, family members who have been affected by, um, in particular, very specific police officer uh, suicide situations. Um, there's a Blue Help group that we were, our writer um, of the episode linked up with, and, and uh, we also were fortunate to connect with Every Town for Gun Safety, which is an organization that um, works to try to deal with um, gun violence prevention in responsible ways. And so even before we put together the story, we were trying to gather 
as much research as possible with the idea again of, of our show attacking things in a way of how can we make suggestions that will add a positive, um, positive ways to approach these situations in the future to our audience as they watch. So it's not just an entertaining 42 minutes and change. Um, it's, it's also something you can take away. Um, with both of those episodes, I believe we had uh, our cast do, you know, kind of a public address um, at the end of each episode to also give you that information, um, hotlines that you can call, places that you can check in with. Um, realizing that for some people that might be the first time they're privy to that information. Absolutely. Um, a side question I thought was quite interesting, somebody was asking in the Q&A was, uh, it's sounding like on both sides of that equation, both the creatives and the, you know, natural and man-made disasters uh, section, how involved do people like to get? So for Kate and Lorraine and people on the, you know, more governmental side of it, are you like, yes, please call us and ask us. We, we can't wait to help. Um, yeah, I think so. I think uh, we would like to be involved in, in the process. And you've seen when it works well, you know, you can have a lot of success. If you look at the movie Contagion, you had a lot of public health experts that apparently participated in that writing process. And it made for a really realistic scenario I mean, the only thing that was different between the COVID-19 pandemic and what happened in the movie is that the virus in the movie was much deadlier, but otherwise it was incredibly realistic and it's quite eerie to watch it now having experienced COVID. So it's, and, and the thing is there's emergency managers everywhere. And I know Gabby um, is, is also working with writers to help source people, to help source experts. So I think reaching out to them and, and getting that expert feedback is is key and there's a lot of us to go around and uh, definitely there is interest in getting involved. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we're a very chatty bunch. If you are on social media at all, there's a hashtag EMG Twitter and it's just emergency managers talking about emergency management issues. And so you can kind of see what we're tossing around in our head theoretically and kind of um, talking about in more abstract ways. Um, I saw somebody mention in the chat, The Unthinkable by Amanda Ripley, amazing book. If you wanna really get into the mindset of somebody a person, um, a victim or survivor responding to a disaster, an incredible book. I strongly recommend it for everybody. Um, but yeah, we I, I like being reached out to. I think also the public experiences disaster stories more than they experience disasters. And so it's in our best interest to ensure that those disasters, totally understanding Aaron's point of you're telling stories in a 30, 47 minute, two and a half hour time frame you don't want to tell the accurate documentary story of a 24-hour EOC activation it's super boring you can go to state of california's cal oes website and watch their eoc live feed it is just people milling around at desks you don't you don't want that to be your story um but what you guys put on tv and store in books and all that stuff what you guys write what stories you tell it impacts what people do during disasters in terms of what they think they should do. Um, you know, a great example is a lot of people forever in earthquakes thought that they should get in doorways um, and lean into doorways or they heard about the triangle of life. I think it's a triangle of death. I like to call it because you're going to die if you do that, but people would just lean up against walls instead of getting under things. Um, we want people to drop cover and hold on, by the way, if you do experience an earthquake, drop cover and hold on, please. But, you know, in media, people see things, they internalize that and then they react that way. And we don't always have the same sort of pull that you guys have in terms of getting attention. And so we're like a whisper of correction in a sea of incorrect <laughs> misconceptions sometimes. So it's in our best interest for you guys to tell accurate stories. They're still compelling, obviously, and still um, interesting and not me doing ICS forms all day. <laughs> um, that's no fun. But yeah, and also, you know, my job, I'm a communicator. It's my role in emergency management. Um, so I totally understand having to tell a compelling story, even if the story that I'm telling is an accurate one, there's a fire, you need to get out or you will die. Um, that's still a story that I'm trying to tell somebody about their own life, what could be happening to them. And so um, I think we have to work together as much as possible to make sure that our stories are different stories, but you know, still in the same universe. <laughs> yeah, to, to back up what Kate is saying, is I, I wrote on, I was in the CSI universe for a while, I wrote on CSI New York, and there's the the, the thing that I think a lot of people have heard of, the CSI effect, the 
was a thing for a while when the first CSI show came out was a big hit. It was such a big hit that a certain segment of the population started to believe that that's how forensic science works, that you can get a result back within 15 minutes and you can get, you know, a, you know, you can solve a crime off of half a fingerprint on a Coke bottle that's five years old, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> so you would find in real situations, real life situations, or real life, mostly courtrooms where the jury and, and the, you know, people would start to expect that type of efficiency. And it's a reminder, you know, again, like backing up with Kate saying that there is a tremendous responsibility in the stories that are told and put out um, to make sure that the, uh, the essence, the truth of the situation is conveyed because you do influence the way people tend to feel about crises and, and hazards and the way uh, these things tend to, to, you know, to play out in real life. Okay, you guys, it's a big sharing screen moment. Aaron, this is a perfect transition. So we've talked about resources and Gabby, you were so great putting all those in the chat. Uh, okay, we're checking out some SWAT here, everybody. Case study coming up. Uh, there's LA City Hall right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've talked a little bit about this already. Uh, we're diving deep into the writing section of it here. What are the commonalities or archetypes of heroic figures and people? And then I really love this next one. What are rarely portrayed yet important characteristics? Because, you know, hey, getting a, a leg up on our accuracy here and it's going to make the stories more three dimensionally true. And then, of course, what are some other uh, resources? And where do we look for our characters and story inspiration? So I'm gonna flip back now to one, some of our wonderful pictures. Um, so please, what are, what are some characteristics and archetypes that are, that are always good to have? Um, well, I, I can start on that. And then Lorraine, certainly, I think you work in a kind of a different sector than I do. So you can speak to same type of people, but different sort of work sector. But in government, I mean, people don't generally go into government for the money. They're going into this work to help people. And, you know, I think sometimes not as much with police and fire and first responder type portrayals of characters, but with the average bureaucrat, there can be kind of a portrayal as them as, you know, it's slow and it's lazy and it's, you know, not dedicated to the job and don't really care, um, you know, ignored the problem until the, while the scientist was shaking them until something blew up, you know, and that's not generally in my experience, the case with most government employees, they're there to do, to help people. And often they're just under-resourced, um, you know, so if there's a gap maybe in their ability to respond, it's usually an issue of not having the adequate training or resources or materials or money is often a big thing. So I think that's one thing that I don't know if it gets portrayed enough is people who are responding to disasters, not just government employees, there's um, the Red Cross is made up of, I believe, 90% volunteers. These are people who are not getting paid. They are waking up at 3 a.m. to go open a shelter for an apartment complex that burned down. And they're often um, not doing that in comfortable situations. They're probably in a high school gymnasium or something like that. Um, and they're dealing with people in their immediate trauma. So the people who are responding to crises, crises desperately want to help people. That's their motivation in all of this. And I think that's the core sort of fundamental archetype. I will say that there's another type of emergency responder. It's kind of like the, it's almost like an adrenaline junkie, like, um, I mean, I'm not, again, a firefighter, so I'm not that kind of adrenaline junkie, but um, I enjoy a good emergency response. Like kind of, it's, for lack of a better word, it's fun. Um, it's what you got into the business to do. It's, you know, you get to really stretch your muscles as an emergency manager, as a responder. Um, I always joke that I got into this because I'm a very anxious person. I don't like no, not knowing what's going on. And the best way to know what's going on is to be the responder. So um, a lot of people who are really kind of like, yeah, adrenaline junkies, disaster junkies. Everybody I know who works in emergency management watches disaster stuff a lot. I watch two shows I really love called Air Disasters and Disasters at Sea. And it's just a, it's an hour long documentary about a plane crash or a boat crash. And if you wanna get a sense of how long an investigation for a real disaster takes, watch that. Cause it's usually about a year. Um, it's a very long process to get a really good sense of what actually happened. So I think that's kind of one, two kind of main archetypes and I'm Maureen you might have other experiences as well yeah and I guess I can talk about the the podcast that I hosted last year featuring people who 
were working or, or helping uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic and what kind of people I came across. And really the main thing is that it's everyday people who really step up. Obviously you have the people who train for this, who work in, in the space, um, really preparing for it. But in, in a disaster, you really need people to step up and you need people who were there, who are where the emergency is happening to step up. And really for the most part, it was like everyday people uh, doing their job, doing what they were trained to do, but in really challenging circumstances. And what the pandemic highlighted was how interconnected we are and how much the actions of those around us really uh, are critical to us getting through this uh, crisis together. So whether it's you're stranded in a tourist destination and the borders of your country have closed. And so now you have flight attendants who are pulling shift after shift to come and, you know, to help you get back to where you're from. Uh, of course, our, our, our medical force, our nurses, or even people behind the scenes. Like um, I interviewed someone who was in charge of fatality management for the city of New York and what that is like. Um, and it's also a type of job that really doesn't get much attention at all. So when it comes to common characteristics that I saw, it's really people pursuing professions, uh, you know, in, in service of others and certainly don't think of themselves as heroes. And it really doesn't matter what your background is. Everybody has the ability to step up in a crisis situation and help. If I can ask Aaron uh, to kind of go with more of the character development of that within the storylines, then thank you both Kate and Lorraine and Gabby. I'm like, I'm so interested and I just keep leaning forward and going, wow. <laughs> but um, Aaron, if we could look about, you know, you've been talking previously about um, how the emotion is the main thing to start with and what you're, and, you know, kind of working it backwards with what disaster, what situation you're putting into the storyline. Uh, and then how do you approach the character development um, for the different kinds of people in the stories? Because we have the ones that we expect to step up and be heroes like Hondo um, and you know the other uh, SWAT team members. So how do we look at it from their point of view and those who are impacted by the crisis who are either the hostages, the victims, or you know, even though we don't want to emphasize the shooters, the shooters. So uh, coming at it from that type of uh, development. Well, I, um, you know, I've, I've written on different types of shows that, that deal with with hazards and crises in different ways. Um, you know, I was even before, um, and I'll get this swat in just a second. You know, when I was uh, on staff on a show called Southland. Um, um, a few years ago, you know, our approach on that show was that we did countless interviews with real life police officers, um, detectives, um, you know, first responders. And what I found that I'll never forget and went on countless ride alongs and um, was just how what what a lot of shows may not try to capture as much as perhaps we, we could is just how they're human beings, how in every profession, there are different types of human beings. There, there are some that are adrenaline junkies. There are some that genuinely want to help. There are some, um, many police officers I ran into who, who it was a job, you know? <laughs> you got out of high school, you're looking for a job, you got a secure pension, that's the job you chose, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Others who inherited it, the legacy from you know family who that you know who, whose tradition that is, um, and so depending on on the story that you're telling, certainly the stories that that I've always been interested in is really just trying to show the dimensions of the human being. You know, no one is simply defined by the job that they do. So what is what else is there to them? You know, um, and it's kind of that thing of what defines a hero. It's not it's not and it's that classic, you know, saying, it's not the absence of fear, right? It's, it's facing fear and, and still persevering despite the fear. So how do you, in a show, what you hope to be able to dramatize is, is, is multiple layers of what that human being is. Um, you know, on certain shows, I've been really fortunate. On Southland, we're, I mean, Southland, we're fortunate to do it. But on SWAT, we're now also fortunate to do it. We're, we're able to, we make a priority to tell the human sides as much as possible. 
you know, uh, going back to our, our school shooting episode, you know, one of the things that resonates in that episode, I feel the most is the effects on our officers when they leave the job, you know, our, um, we have an officer, uh, Deacon is played by actor Jay Harrington, who in that episode uh, has a really touching connection with his family and his daughter in light of what he went through on the job. His, his daughter has no idea of what his job was like that day. Um, but he's a guy who, who tries not to take his work home. And despite that, it, it struggles with that sometimes and has to process that, you know? So, you know, when we look at, when we try to approach these storylines, um, you know, from the, the standpoint of different types of people, you know, what we're looking at is trying to show these different types of people in different environments, different lights, um, you know, just with, with the idea that it's not as simple a lot of times as good guy, bad guy, you know, or that person's a, a cop and that's all they are, or a soldier or a, or a doctor, you know, that person might be a really great father or not might be a really bad father and a great doctor, you know, uh, these things can exist within the same uh, package. And that's where good drama a lot of times tends to come from is what are the shades of gray that you can look at? Um, no one is absolutely 100%, you know, great and generous all the time. You know, what are the things that are the personal challenges that you face that, that can influence um, sometimes why you do the job and, and how you do the job and that's where we tend to live is, is looking for stories that, that hit upon those things. And if I could jump back in real quick with, um, you know, so we've talked about the overall characteristics that we, you know, for the archetypes and coming at it from the character development and the three dimensionality of them. Um, are there some rarely portrayed yet important characteristics that are really going to bump it up even further? Well, I mean, here's the thing. Um, cause 2020 was an, is, it was an interesting year for many, many <laughs> reasons to say the least. That's an understatement. Um, certainly my perspective as a writer of color was, was unique in, in going through that. And if there's anything that I, that I felt as though, you know, we can highlight certainly more, it's just the idea that it doesn't have to be. You know, a lot of times we're, we're very keen on putting things in the very safe boxes, you know, when we're telling our story. So again, the good guy, bad guy narrative is something that we tend to do a lot. We're talking about man-made crises. And the truth is, is that a lot of times it's, it's more layered than that. You know, you'll find, you know, people that might do really heinous crimes, but might be really nice to their mothers. You know, you'll find really, really heroic cops who might be terrible husbands, you know, and and in a world where we were, you know, last year looking to try to improve communication, I think through seemingly dis between seemingly disparate groups, um, shining more light on what makes us all human, I think, you know, takes a, a even more important real life um, emphasis, you know. So, you know, and I always felt that way. I felt that way even more so coming off of last year. And, and certainly now in looking at stories, that's always to me like part of the storytelling process is, is looking at not just the job and how it's executed and whether or not we save the day, but how we save the day. And, and again, the effects on the person who is in the midst of having that job. Um, I think it, all, it helps for the viewer to be able to understand that you know, that individual who's chosen to do that job more. And I think on the other side, um, you know, it, it can also help to, for people to actually see themselves more reflected in a three-dimensional light, um, as opposed to being held up to, you know, a standard of, you know, the hero image, if that makes any sense. Absolutely, yeah, the flawed hero, we can relate much more so. Yeah, human, I would say, right? Because we're all flawed in some way. That's that's the thing that we try to be truthful about. So where are your flaws and are you being honest about them? And, you know, are we addressing them? And are you actually working to try to get better? You know, whether that is, you know, whether that is a first responder or that is a criminal that they're going after, it's, it's trying to humanize any of those individuals in a very finite space. We have 42 minutes for a week, you know? So it's, it's looking for those moments of like highlighting you know, what makes that person human, you know, just understand a little bit more of, of why um, 
you know, where they got to where they are and why they're doing what they do. And you don't often get that in life, right? You don't often get the why. We get a lot of the what, the where, the when. The why is really, really hard. But, you know, if you can shine some light on it, then hopefully that leads to more understanding. I'm just, I'm so engaged here. Let me pull my screen back up. So we're jumping into, in just a moment, we're jumping into our, uh, here we come with our, our kind of case study here with the active shooter episode from SWAT, which I'm confident, you know, all of our audience has seen. Um, basically, whoops, let me pull it back up over here. Um, so Lorraine, you were previously in charge of planning for active shooters, and I can switch back and forth here, uh, on campuses. So good fortune, you know, that we've got the expert of experts here with us. Um, so can you clarify how, you know, the realities of how these shooter scenarios take place? I know we talked briefly about how, you know, they run practice scenarios and everything for when the big moment comes, if you could clarify further. Yes, absolutely. So unfortunately, we have a lot of real life examples to draw from to really understand what happens in an active shooter situation. And the FBI releases reports about every year on statistics and such. So you can just easily Google those and really become familiar with what types of events we really face. And what you'll see is the majority of, of perpetrators are men, 40% uh, of them uh, commit suicide at the end. And um, one interesting piece is most of the sh uh, sh where the shootings take place, the shooters oftentimes have a personal connection to that location. They have either worked there, are currently working there, or know someone who is working there. And when it comes to also, for example, like active shooter situations, they tend to be over in 10 to 15 minutes. And even that's a long time. They happen extremely fast because police is, is coming right away and their one goal is to neutralize the threat. And so what I think is really interesting and can be interesting for writers is the behavior of the shooter. Uh, what is it truly like? And when I conducted my active shooter trainings for our staff and students and faculty at UCLA, I like to show a video um, that was done following the Parkland shooting in Florida. And all you see is a map of the school and you see dots uh, that represent the shooter and the students and the teachers. And you get to see the movements that the shooter did, where he went and did he backtrack? Did he breach doors? And uh, because you know, okay, some, the shooter must start somewhere, he shoots there. Meanwhile, what you're supposed to do is lock yourself in, right, wherever you are. And then the shooter leaves and he very likely can come back. So if you don't go and, and lock your door, even if you were hurt or you were injured, you should still do that because he can always come back because he knows that his goal is to get to kill as many people as he can in the shortest amount of time. And so how can he go ahead and do that? So I think the behavior is really interesting and it helps in determining and preparing yourself for how to, um, you know, what the best practices would be if you ever find yourself in that situation. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm pulling my screen back up. Thank you. It's uh, so much to learn. It's amazing. Uh, so now how do we approach current and pertinent events of the day? And you know, advice on how to. We've been discussing quite a bit of this throughout on how to approach approach this crisis storylines and topics. Um, again, I really appreciated that Aaron specifically is saying, "Hey, it still comes down to the character and the emotions and what you're wanting to portray." And so the event is then kind of the overarching part that backs up the emotional wherewithal and, and follow through. So, how else do we approach these current events? And of course. How has COVID impacted the shows? What can we what can we learn there? Well, I would say, um, and uh, you know, for the writing side of it, I would definitely defer to Aaron. But for, you know, as my a viewer, I suppose, as a, as an emergency manager and a viewer of what you guys write, um, don't discount the idea that people are very traumatized by this. The past year, um, a deep unaddressed community trauma. We have not grieved as a country in a major way. Um, we have not really come to terms with 
how society has responded to this in a meaningful way. And so I think, I mean, from what I've seen from a lot of my own friends and people I work with is they're not ready for those stories because they're still living the story. Um, you know, and so I think there's still space to tell those stories for sure, because they are about characters and you can set a character in any setting and tell the story. But I would say be cognizant of the very real trauma that is still going on and is going to be lasting for a long time based on COVID-19. Um, this is not going away anytime soon. I, there was a big announcement about more vaccine coming out, which is wonderful, but um, this is not something that's going to be solved by the one year anniversary of the lockdowns or anything like that. And so um, I would just be very, very aware of that because even if people don't tell you, there's a very, you know, reminders and anniversaries are, can be very traumatic for disaster victims. And we all are now disaster victims. Um, this is the largest global disaster that we um, have in recent memory. And um, so I would just say, be cognizant of that and be cognizant of how um, traumatic this has been for people who are responders. Um, obviously frontline workers, this has been just deeply traumatizing, both in terms of the response and the lack of support and the, the physical, actual, literal danger that they're in, they've been in for months and months now. Um, but for people behind the scenes as well, you know, this is, like, like I said before, we all went into this field to help people and to solve problems. Emergency managers, our goal is to fix a problem that other people have not been able to fix. Um, you know, they are out doing something else and they have a problem. We take it and we say, if we're a cleanup crew, we got this. Um, this has been a deeply unfixable problem. And for a lot of emergency managers, and maybe trauma is a strong word, but it's been very demoralizing for a lot of people who are in response to this. Um, I can't tell you how, how many people I know who are burned out because they've been doing this nonstop for so long that they're like, you know, I thought this was a career for me and I don't know that it's a career for me anymore because I feel so unsupported. I feel so um, under-resourced and appreciated. And I feel like I'm not, I'm just treading water. I'm not making any meaningful difference in solving this problem. And we're all essentially problem solvers. It's incredibly frustrating. And so I think those are really two important points to consider if you guys are looking to tell sort of COVID-19 stories or similar stories about things that have happened in the past year, just how unaddressed and deep some of the trauma is. Yeah, just, if, if I could piggyback on that, sorry, so just for a second, Jen, is, um, I mean, you asked the question before about what, what types of crises are difficult to write about. And I would say the ones you're currently living through are probably the most difficult to write about. Um, for a variety of reasons. Literally, you're, you are participating in it. And also, you're, you're not completely sure that the audience wants another healthy dose of that, you know, when they sit down to watch. Typically, audiences want to escape to a certain extent, whatever trauma they're experiencing throughout the day. So we really haven't had anything where it's 24-7 trauma every day, you know, in the past, you know, you've had terrorist attacks that happen in confined spaces and you have time to separate from that. But with an ongoing situation every single day, think about things that were as simple as, you know, we talked about the movie Contagion, right? That exists, it, that came out a few years ago. If Contagion was not made a few years ago, it could not be made right now. You know, no, no one would, want to make it and you know even fewer people probably want to watch it one kind of funny thing for our for our show SWAT although at the time it wasn't funny it was real time around this time last year we we considered doing an episode about um a viral um problem a viral crisis in Los Angeles and this was real time as we were coming up with this story we were like wait a second this, this thing, this, uh, this COVID thing, this is looking more and more serious, you know, um, perhaps that's not the best time to tell it. And that's before we had really even gotten into the heart of what would end up being, you know, the crisis that we're currently in. So certainly, um, you know, when you are actually a participant within it, you know, what, what I can say is this, is that in looking at stories from the past, you know, and the closest thing that probably anybody can compare this to would be the Spanish flu from, you know, 1918 or so, is that my hope is that in the same way coming off of the heels of that, you had the roaring 20s, you know, people trying to have a good time again. I'm hoping that our future has something like that, you know, in place. And at that point, you know, maybe in the future, we can have some perspective. Certainly, I can tell you this, and I'll sum it up, is that 
you had the personal aspect that we're all going through. And then we also had the storytelling aspect as to, you know, it was a real decision. Do you incorporate the reality of the world into the stories you're telling? Do you risk alienating an audience or do you completely ignore it? And you then you'd run the, the risk of having the audience go, well, that's not real because that's not my world. You know, we had to make a conscious decision early last year. And we decided to say that our show exists in a world where COVID does, but we're not going to put it front and center, you know. Um, and we didn't know if that was going to be a right or wrong call, but we had to make that decision. And many other shows had to do the same thing. And when you're talking about, again, the reality, how do you represent reality? We had to decide we're going for the reality of the emotion. How do we feel in that environment without going to the, the particulars, um, hoping that, that our audience will come along with us? That's great, because I was just about to ask you, how has COVID impacted your show? And look at that. You've already answered it for me. Fantastic. I, I do want to say this, though, I guess, because I'm, I'm really proud of how our show has worked with um, first responders. We have an infectious disease expert, Dr. Um, Marissa Baker, who's been really instrumental in keeping us up to date with um, policies and with the latest regarding um, just how to, to make sure our, our sets are as safe as possible. And that's a weekly update, you know, and, and our show has been, I think, a, a good example of how things can be done in this current era. Um, you know, the thing is with, with Hollywood sets, those in the past used to be um, traditional congregating spots where, you know, big, large groups of people would be together, whether that was the cast rehearsing or crew members working together. And that was just a big sea change last year of getting used to trying to do some of these same jobs with fewer people spaced out, wearing masks underneath, you know, a few layers. Um, and we were figuring that out real time. So I'm really proud of our crew who really has championed and been champions with that. Um, and, and it's still been able to manage to, to get the job done. Fantastic. Um, I'm, I'm crying. I'm looking at my clock right now, everybody. We've talked about this here. Okay, we're getting to some practical action steps, even though we've already kind of been mixing them in throughout. So how do you pitch a crisis-focused storyline? Kind of what other ex, 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 ugh, additional things should we have? So we're hearing a lot today about how we're, uh, you know, conferring with the experts. I would think that would be uh, an excellent point to have within your pitch to say, hey, I've already talked with the with Kate and Lorraine at FEMA and Aaron's in my back pocket here. I can give him a call anytime about, uh, you know, storylines and how to incorporate and go from the emotional point of view. How else, what else do we want to put in there for pitching purposes? And what other materials should, should you have prepared, ready to go? Or did I just sum it all up and we're done with this page? <laughs> no, research, I would say, you want to make sure that people understand you've done your homework on the actual um, whatever crisis you've chosen to tell a story about. You know, if you're doing the Chicago earthquake from the, the turn of the century last year, you want to get a firm sense that the t storyteller has actually done their research on what happened after that earthquake, not just based on assumptions or based on it's what Lorraine and Kate were saying earlier. It's like, what was the reality behind that particular event? Um, you know, it's for me, it, you know, aside from the story itself, which of course is king and, and, you know, think about movies like Titanic that were huge, but at the core of it, what do you remember? You remember Jack and Rose on the front of the boat and you remember their romance. You want to make sure you have a good story to tell. But those bits of uh, the, the details, making sure that you're actually, you've dedicated yourself to tell the story the best way, the most authentic way, go a long ways in the pitch. And also, allow a storyteller to have confidence when they're pitching the idea. You can marry really great research with a really great, you know, clear story, then you tend to have something. Excellent, thank you. And then continuing on with that practical application theme. Uh, so what action steps can we take? We were, we're talking about research, knowing your subject. Uh, are there other items that we can focus on doing while we're, you know, while we're sitting in our own little home offices, working from home and getting puppies and everything. 
Uh, what else can we be going like, boom, I got this here. I've created my pitch deck. I've been talking to the experts, doing my research. What else can we can we add to our list? Well, can I jump in on this just really quickly? Because I here's the, to me the positive spin with all of this is that we are more equipped right now in human history to get work done when uh, when a crisis like this hits than at any time ever before because of the internet. Yes. You know, um, for those who remember a time before the internet, you know, it would have been really really hard to get a lot of this stuff done had this crisis had hit before you could do things with your computer. So, I mean, now there's really no excuse to, to not be able to reach out to people, to be able to read, you know, materials, to be able to watch documentaries, to be able to, you know, to do the necessary research. You don't have to trek to a library and look through a microfilm. How about that for a data reference? Um, you know, so I, I look at it as like right now, you know, you know, I would just, I would, I mean, I am, you know, it's doing just as much research, talking with as many smart individuals like Kate and Lorraine, connecting with people, um, having good questions ready to go. Think about the questions that you want to ask and the things that you, the information you need to get, because there's a billion different things that people can tell you, but being very, very clear about what you're seeking and then using the computer and oftentimes, you know, resources that don't cost money um, to actually reach out then and gather the information. Um, you know, I, right now you, you have, you, you just, you have the opportunity. A lot of, a lot of us have, you know, the time that you didn't have before and, you know, you might as well make the most of it. I mean, you take a break from writing, you need to take your hands off the keyboard, take that time to become prepared for emergencies. If you guys could do that. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you're at home. This is a great time to make sure that your actual home is safe. You know, you want to survive the disaster so you can eventually write the, Academy Award winning screenplay about the disaster. So please prepare. That's the true emergency manager right there. <laughs> okay, so this is our, I'm double checking our questions because alas, we are mind bogglingly already coming, you know, to the end of our time. Uh, we've gone through pretty much everything for one, you know, way or another in the questions. A couple questions say we didn't get to them because they were about legal rights of stuff. That's not us, that's a lawyer, everybody. So just there we are on that. Uh, a couple of other resources here, a reminder, the wonderful Gabrielle Allman here, my co-host here, brainbullish.com, go to WGF so that you can get uh, all the resources she's been talking about. Uh, Lorraine's podcast, there we go. Here's our link right there. Okay, let me see. Are we putting those in? Oh, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so that is coming up, everybody. Slipping into the next one. Take our survey, please. All right, if you loved us, please take the survey. If you didn't, never mind. We're gonna give you a link in just a few moments to click on that, please do. Check it out. We're giving away four final draft downloads. Uh, if you fill in the survey, we're gonna be giving those away to randomly selected respondents. So let me see if I can get us back to, here we go. I'm gonna jump in the chat now as well to put in that link. I have fingers and toes crossed. It's going to work and this is going to all, please. Okay, let me put that in. So that is the link right there for our survey. And again, above that, we've got uh, the link for Lorraine's podcast. And we've got, uh, look at all this red cross. Oh my goodness, look in there, our contact sheet. Everybody, so please do click on that. And please, of course, follow us on socials for Business of Creating, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Check out our website, businessofcreating.org and get on our email list for future events, both with Brain and Bullish and the Writers Guild and future partnerships we, we don't even know about yet because boy, when we can, you know, Pair with people like Gabby and Brain and Bullish, it's it's a win for us for sure. We're so fortunate to be able to learn from these amazing people today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, so much. And of course, thank you, Writers Guild Foundation, Enid and Cat. And final draft. Thank you, thank you. Uh, everybody, please tell me you're gonna come back for another another round of talking about crisis-focused storylines. And you know, whoops the humongous thank you from all of us here. 
And there we go. Thank you so much, everybody. And yes. All right, everybody. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.